I'm speaking with Colgate University Professor of Peace and Conflict Studies and Geography, Theo Balve. Theo Balve. Theo Balve, thank you for coming on TYT Interviews. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're going to keep this interview narrowly focused to what's in the news right now in Col coming out of Colombia. About a month ago or so, the government and the rebels came to a peace deal. It was rejected in a national popular referendum. We I want to talk about that a little bit. And that was going to be all we talked about, except just the other day, over the, uh, a new peace deal has been proposed. So uh, to the extent that anyone knows anything about it, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. So let's start there, Professor Bali. What is, uh, as far as you know, and it's hot off the presses, what modifications have, have the negotiating parties made to last month's peace accord that, that we see in, in the, the peace accord that came out this weekend? Um, well, it's not entirely, uh, well, it, it will be clearer now that the uh, full text of the agreement has been uh, made public. It's a document of more than 300 pages, so considering that it was just released this morning, everyone is still kind of going through it. Um, one wishes almost that they had track changes on it, so you could just kind of skim. Um, but by and large, uh, it seems that um, th all the points that the no coalition uh, wanted to there to to be addressed in the new version of the agreement has been addressed so the 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 people that were the main kind of politicians against the um the peace agreement originally sent the government a list of points and demands essentially that they wanted reformed in the new deal um, and the government took those pages and pages of things and distilled them down to 57 uh, main points so the government took that 57-point agenda and then went back to Havana, where the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the rebel group, uh, FARC, uh, where its negotiators were sort of waiting. And uh, together they hammered out, um, you know, a new agreement uh, that included all but one of the points that uh, the no coalition wanted. Um, so there were a series of of things that um, that the No Coalition wanted clarified or uh, revisited, um, the one point that they uh, did not, uh, that the FARC was not willing to to give in on, was the ability for their main leaders to run for office and hold elected office. Um, the No Coalition, you know, really seized on that point and said, you know. The No thinks that many of the FARC's uh, fighters are considers them terrorists, and and they would say things like, you know, we don't want terrorists, um, you know, sitting in Congress, for instance. Um, so that was the main point that the FARC actually did not seat on. So there will potentially be FARC leaders elected to Congress coming, you know, in the near future. Um, everything else that they wanted. Uh, was addressed and resolved between the FARC and the government in in some way. So, um, for instance, just to give you a couple examples, uh, the no vote wanted a clear sort of accounting of the FARC's assets, assets that would be used in turn for uh, reparations to the victims of the FARC. Um, the, FAR uh, the no vote also wanted um, the FARC to... Um, there was, an, there was part in a, of the agreement that would give the FARC's new political party sort of special treatment um, as an emerging new political force in the country. And the no vote said, no, we want the FARC to be treated, its political party to be treated just like any other in Colombia. So rather than um, state support at 20 percent, it should be state support at 15 percent, which is what every party, uh, recognized party in Colombia uh, gets. The other thing that they really wanted resolved was that um, some of the FARC's leaders are um, will there is a transitional justice process, um, and the FARC was adamant about its leaders not going to to seeing the inside of a jail cell. They wanted an alternative kind of of justice system, a more restorative kind of justice rather than a punitive one. Um, but it was vague as to what exactly that would look like. And so the government and the FARC ironed out some more specifics about um, the 
the term is the privation of certain liberties. Now we know what that will actually look like. The FARC's main leaders will be concentrated in particular parts of the country where they will not be able to leave as part of their uh, transitional justice process. So again, by and large, 95% uh, of the claims that the no wanted address have been addressed now. So the arguments uh, that the no had for being against the agreement no longer uh, really stand. They've been resolved, essentially. Let me ask a few short questions. So is this latest agreement also subject to a popular referendum? Does it have to be approved by the voters? Yeah, so it's not clear exactly what way forward the government's going to choose. There's essentially three options. Uh, one is to organize a new up or down vote, a new referendum. Um, which under the, uh, the law that allowed the recent referendum to happen could go ahead. So the, the one, option one is the, a new referendum. Option two is to send the new agreement to Congress and essentially pass it through the standard legislative process. Um, it seems like that's going to be the most likely, um, but it's still not clear. So in this case, the peace agreement would go to Congress, uh, Congress would hash it out and pass it as a law, and the government's um, political coalition has a healthy majority in Congress. So uh, presumably that would go through. The third option, um, which is um, probably the least likely, is that the peace agreement would go and there would be essentially open assemblies at the municipal level. So every municipal a municipality in Colombia would hold a kind of open forum uh, at the level of like the city council to uh, decide whether they approve or not. Um, that would seem to be a very drag, you know, long drawn out process. So the most likely one would seem <clears throat> to be um, the congressional route. And the reason for that is because I think that the government and the FARC um, and uh, the United Nations, which is accompanying this process, wants to see this issue resolved as quickly as possible. Sure, it's about time. You yeah. keep talking about FARC and the government. Are those the only two parties that have been involved in these negotiations, or are there other parties? That... Um, so principally, yes, the talks have been between the government on the one hand and the main negotiators of the FARC on the other hand. Um, when the negotiations were made public and the formal peace talks process began, there was a lot of criticism, especially from civil society groups, social movements, NGOs, etc., cetera, um, for there not being more means uh, for popular um, and grassroots kind of input into um, the peace talks. And the government and the FARC uh, very kind of um, laudably, I think, uh, created a series of mechanisms for there to be more uh, popular participation in the peace process. So throughout the peace talks, there were delegations going to uh, Havana in Cuba, which would meet with the negotiating parties and basically express the sorts of things that they wanted um, included or addressed. So everything from certain victims' rights groups that had um, that sent delegates to Havana to um, women's organizations, uh, Afro-Colombian and indigenous groups sent theirs, human rights organizations, uh, religious groups. Um, so there was, you know, this was a two two-way negotiation, but there was a lot of input. Um, a lot of proposals taken up from civil society that made their way into the final agreement. Well, okay, that, that's interesting. But uh, so as far as the paramilitaries go, they're, they're not going to become rogue. Uh, if, if this agreement is approved either by Congress or by the national referendum, or, are, do you have confidence that there won't be other parties that will violate it? Yeah, so certainly um, one of the, the, the difficult things about the Colombian conflict uh, is the number of actors that have been involved. So, um, yes, there's the government with its military, there's the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia FARC, which is, you know, signing this peace agreement, but then there's another uh, rebel organization called um, the National Liberation Army, the ELN, which is um, just now beginning uh, a new peace process with the government, and they're still out, out there, um, you know, with their guns. And then um, since the 1980s, there's been a third actor um, in, or fourth, I guess you could say, actor in the conflict, which is uh, right-wing paramilitaries funded primarily through um, the drug trade. And they, ha along with um, the military, have um, worked 
very closely in the past and are responsible for, um, I think, a majority of the human rights abuses throughout the history of the conflict. Um, and those groups, a version of them demobilized uh, between 2003 and 2006. But the heirs of those groups or the successors of those groups, of those paramilitary groups, are still active. And these are essentially um, the private armies of, or yeah, the private armies of drug lords. They're, they're private drug trafficking armies um, that for a long time were the guerrillas' arch enemy. And those groups are still out there. So even with this new agreement, it doesn't mean, you know, that all is said and done, especially considering the fact that the war on drugs will continue. And I think that that's what poses the largest um, sort of practical risk to um, a lasting peace in Colombia, the drug war. Well, thank, so now we're caught up with the news, and really, may, perhaps this week could have done this interview tomorrow, and we'd have know a lot more. But now I'd like to j jump backwards and talk a little bit about what is it, what is the origin of this Colombian conflict, and what is it about Colombia and this conflict that has allowed it to drag on for decades compared to uh, the neighboring countries, Peru, which had the shining path, but it didn't drag on for decades, and Bolivia is a little more... Uh, uh, there's, a, or there's an absence of such a rebel group of violent conflict. And why is it Colombia, not Venezuela, Bolivia, Peru, and other uh, Ecuador? You know? How did this mm -hmm. start, and why are we still talking about it 50 years later? Yeah, so I, I would say, let me begin by saying two reasons why it's lasted so long. Uh, one, uh, the levels of economic inequality, especially in the countryside, have persisted, you know, for decades. And you could say the same thing about many Latin American countries. But add to that the fact that Colombia has been um, the main producer. I think 90 percent of the world's cocaine comes from Colombia. So that has added an accelerant, um, you know, fuel on the fire, essentially, um, to, to the armed conflict. Um, but let me go back a bit and say, um, so in the 19... Um, a lot of one of the difficult things about the Colombian conflict is exactly when to uh, draw the line as to where it began, because Colombia has had civil wars and violence uh, for a really long time. But for the most part, uh, people date the conflict back to the 19 1964, when the FARC formally declared uh, its existence. And it did so um, based on a sort of pretty standard, um, at least in Latin America, communist-inspired uh, political platform, especially um, one aimed at addressing um, the lack of, of, of uh, lands for um, poor peasant farmers and uh, the inequality that I spoke about um, at the beginning of this question. So. Um, that inequality and that uh, long-standing demand for access to uh, farmland um, and not only those things, but also uh, political exclusion. So every progressive kind of political expression that's come up in Colombian history to address those long-standing inequalities has been violently squashed. So. Um, Essentially, that created a, a kind of reinforcing cycle between repression, protest, uh, and armed struggle. So um, in the eyes of the FARC, the only way uh, to make itself um, and its political position been advanced has been through, um, you know, the armed, uh, the armed conflict, the armed struggle in, in their eyes. So um, that's the inequality is still there, um, and that's one of the things that the conflict, the uh, negotiations have tried to um, address, and the um, drug war is still there. Um, so that's one of the things that has uh, made the FARC such a long-standing and <clears throat> and you know old rebel organization is that they've had a, basically a bottomless source of of money uh, to finance their political ideology and their political struggle. Yeah, let me get a little speculative or philosophic. Well, we enlightened people like to think the whole world uh, is one big human family, but there are cultural differences. The French have a different mentality than the Germans, and uh, the Russians are very different than the Chinese. Is there a cultural consideration here as to why Colombia is different? In, in Mexico in 1994, I think uh, the, the Zapatista movement came out of nowhere. Uh, 
And that didn't last decades. That's already faded away in, in terms of its intensity. Is there, you've given some of the political, social, economic reasons of why the conflict has persisted in Colombia. Is there a, something about Colombian culture? As you say, the violence goes back many, many decades even before this current conflict. Uh, have people in Colombia come to live and accept violence as part of their lives? Um, to a certain extent, um, so it's it's not that, that that Colombians have something in their DNA that makes them violent. Um, that's that's not true. Um, the conflict is a product of of concrete historical um, social circumstances. But your last point about um, have Colombians grown to accept uh, violence, I think to a certain extent, um, that's that's sort of sort of the case in, in, in a country that has lived with an armed conflict for 50 years, um, it becomes very easy, at least if you're someone who is uh, relatively middle or upper class living in the cities, um, it's relatively easy to have a sort of out of sight, out of mind kind of um, mentality about the armed conflict. You know, to think of it as something that happens, you know, out there in the peripheries of of the country. You know, clearly for the people that live there, um, that's out of sight and out of mind is not a luxury or a privilege that that they can, um, uh, you know, enjoy. Um, but Colombia, I think, is a traumatized society because of these, you know, decades and decades of conflict. And um, a lot of people, especially from abroad, would ask themselves, you know, how is it possible for a country who has been at war for so long to reject a peace agreement? Well, I think the answer is partly lies in the, 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 the depth and the extent of the trauma um, associated with the conflict, uh, a trauma inflicted by all sides. Um, and um, I think that that's one of the reasons that, you know, that, well, one of the reasons that explains uh, how the vote turned out initially um, in October. Sure, okay. So I'm doing a series of interviews on Latin American subjects, and there are two areas that I want to get into with every, in, in, in every interview. One is the role of the United States, and one is how the environment plays into whatever the subject at hand is. So let's start with the environment. You study the way the environment is used as a weapon of war and a tool for peace. Can you go into that a little bit in, in Colombia specifically? How, what's the role of the environment or how is it playing into this conflict? Sure. Well, um, in, in several ways, I would say. Um, first of all, I think most clearly um, in the drug war, you know, coca, um, which is the base ingredient of, uh, for cocaine, poppies, which is the base ingredient for heroin, are plants after all. So um, these plants have to be grown somewhere, and mainly in the south and other um, um, sparsely populated uh, parts of the country uh, is where these uh, crops are grown. And um, for since the early 90s, at least, um, and a bit further um, even, uh, the main response to uh, the the this growing of these illicit crops, uh, which are illegal in Colombia for the most part, um, has been aerial spraying. So the fumigation of a chemical herbicide, basically an enhanced and more poisonous version of Roundup uh, made by Monsanto, uh, has been sprayed from the air by uh, military contractors. And so the environment in that sense has been sort of ground zero for uh, the war on drugs. Um, and then traffickers engage on, in, in all kinds of sort of cat and mouse games using mangroves and swamps and uh, forests and mountains to evade uh, detection and uh, the, the suppression of, of, of drug trafficking. So um, in that ways, too, the environment has been ground zero. Um, but the other way that it's been ground zero is through uh, conflicts over natural resources. So the conflict has um, always had uh, economic dimensions. You know, what conflict doesn't have economic dimensions? Uh, but key resources like uh, oil, agricultural lands, um, you know, bananas, coffee, every uh, export commodity that, that, that Colombia offers to the world market has in one time or another um, been a party to this, to this conflict. Um, so it's not to say that 
you know, that the Colombian conflict is all about resources and is just about, you know, greed and that there's no grievance. That's not that's not true. There has always been grievance. Um, but there's been a sort of mutual relationship between uh, economic incentives on the one hand and political grievances on the other hand, one fueling uh, the other. So that's the other way that the environment plays in. Yeah, well, we're, we need to talk more and more about how the environment plays into every conflict all over the world, Syria, Colombia, all over Africa. And, and so that's what I'm trying to do one step at a time in these interviews. And then the other uh, party that we like to blame a lot is the United States, which, who can never stop meddling in world affairs. So whether it's in the present or back in the origins of this conflict in the 60s, mm -hmm. uh, what can you tell us about how the role the, the United States played in creating, perpetuating, or uh, a hope attempting to put a lid on this conflict? Yeah, the, the, the United States has been involved uh, every step of the way, um, in some cases um, more than others. But even dating back to the origin, so 1964, when the FARC formed, it was um, out of, uh, it, it, it emerged in response, uh, at least in, in formal ways, like declaring itself as the FARC. They only did that after uh, they were attacked by the government through um, a sort of standard counterinsurgency and bombing campaign in which U.S. advisors played um, a pretty key role in um, advocating and uh, designing the kinds of strategies that were employed by the Colombian military. Um, so at the beginning of the conflict, there's, you know, the United States was involved. And then in the 60s and 70s and even into the 1980s as part of the Cold War, um, the United States has always been a very close ally of the Colombian government. So military funding has always been streaming into Colombia uh, from Washington. And then in the 1980s with the cocaine boom um, and the Medellin cartel, Pablo Escobar, um, the United States became uh, even more involved in both the drug war and the conflict itself. Uh, providing military aid. It was thanks to the involvement of the DEA, CIA, that they finally caught, um, well, killed Escobar. Um, and then in the 1990s, uh, under the Clinton administration, uh, Congress passed Plant Columbia, which is a U.S. counter-drug and counter-insurgency program. Um, and that gave, for a period of about 10 years, a little more, uh, gave billions and billions of dollars to one of the uh, militaries in Latin America with the worst human rights records. So um, the United States was very much involved in that way. Um, as the drug war, and then after 9-11, even more closely involved with the military as a counterinsurgency force. Um, and in recent years, under the Obama administration, for instance, uh, the CIA helped the uh, Colombian... Uh, military with real-time intelligence and provided technology for um, remote um, smart missiles, essentially smart bombs, uh, which allowed the government to target the key leaders of the FARC. And by wiping out the leadership, they really kind of broke its... Um, it was one of the things that led them to the negotiating table. The fact that they had had something like three or four uh, of their main leaders killed um, in a matter of, of just years. Um, with the beginning of the peace negotiations, um, at one point, uh, sort of well into the process, um, the Obama administration created a, a peace envoy to Havana and sent him uh, there to sort of act as the U.S. voice in the process. And I have to say that for once, the United States played um, a, a positive role, I think an encouraging role to the parties um, that gave a lot of confidence on both sides that the U.S. was serious about promoting peace and would, in an eventual peace agreement, um, back the peace through greater foreign aid that wasn't so much military-driven as has been in the past, but driven more toward social and economic aid. So um, more recently, the U.S. has played a positive role. Um, what happens now under a Trump administration is sort of anyone's guess. Yeah, well, I'm glad to end this interview and the Obama administration <clears throat> on that positive note. My message to the Trump administration is do something else about drugs other than declaring a war on it and stop trying to find a militaristic solution for every conflict in the world. And I believe uh, 
uh, if you believe his campaign re rhetoric, Donald Trump does want to do that, although I don't believe anything he says because he's not a very thoughtful man. But this is not about Donald Trump. This has been an interview with Professor Teo Balve about the Colombian conflict, which uh, may be soon to end. A, there's a new peace agreement that was just publicized and, and agreed upon uh, this weekend. Its fate remains uh, unknown for sure, but uh, it's, I'm going to believe that it will uh, pass, whether it's Congress or a popular referendum. We'll see. We just talked about that. And uh, I want to wrap it up there. Thank you, Professor Balva, for joining us on TYT Interviews. I would like to welcome you back if there are future developments in Colombia that we want to talk about with our uh, audience. Yeah, sure. That would be great. Thank you. It's been great to have you. Thanks for watching TYT Interviews.